Dangerous subject. So I, I, one of the mechanics. one of mechanics. Yes. Uh, so one of the uh, tasks would be to to build a bridge. I know you all uh, f very familiar with the bridge bridges, but we'll have to make a bridge between uh, infrastructure of civil engineering that exists on the surface of the earth and the different type of infrastructure and the different type of utility. But we are also, you see, it's active mechanics of self-locomotion. We are moving to self-locomotion because our cars are going to move by themselves. Our doors are going to open and windows will go in by themselves. So <coughs> everything is going to be, in, goes in this direction. And we are also part of the living uh, nature. If we look at a big scale, we are just uh, little living creatures that are creating some environment which we call civil environment. But let's see what's happening at a micro scale. Uh, so uh, here you see uh, three moving objects. So they are cells. And as you see, they, uh, they are involved in some kind of traffic. Uh, they are interacting, they are self-driving for sure. There is, no, there is no brain, we are not guiding this, this motion in any way. Uh, but you see they, they collide, but uh, they seem to be peacefully collide. And uh, most, uh, most importantly, they, they self-propel and they are active. And this is a new challenge for, uh, for mechanics, for structural mechanics, for mechanics in general, because obviously mass is being uh, 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 transmitted from point to point. And we need to understand the principles of this locomotion, the principles of this interaction, of this self-driving uh, uh, structures. So now high tech is not to build, as you know, uh, a rocket that would go to, to the moon, but uh, to build something like this that could crawl through the blood vessel or somehow navigate inside our body and reach a certain point and deliver a certain uh, load. And this is where efforts now of mechanicians in particular are focused. Uh, uh, but uh, this is uh, not the, the whole thing. Let me show you another. I'll first show you some movies to, to just uh, motivate the interest in these problems. So here you see this big guy. It's a, it's a cell that's tracing, uh, tries to catch this bacteria, this uh, black uh, point. You see it's... Uh, it follows it and it navigates in a kind of civil uh, structure. You see there are obstacles. You see it reached it and it eliminated. And uh, so this is uh, something that's happening inside our bodies all the time. And this is a big mystery. How, uh, uh, how this active object first self propels, how it navigates, how it, uh, what kind of purpose uh, it follows and how the environment affects it. So in this sense, maybe there is a bridge to civil engineering. Let me show you one more. So in fact, things are a bit more complex sometimes because those were objects on a flat surface. But in reality, inside our body, the elastic environment where those self-propelling uh, objects existed more, this is a computer simulation. This is a called extracellular matrix. That's what fills uh, our body. But this active object, it tries to navigate through it. It's like uh, meandering through the streets in the city, find, finding its way, trying different paths, and then eventually uh, advancing. So, uh, so ultimately, the problem is, in this sense, uh, quite complex and we are at the very beginning of understanding mechanics of it and in particular the active side of these mechanics. So uh, I'll, I'll show, so we are going to talk about very simple example uh, of uh, this type of activity. It's going to be just moving of this type of cells. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to use the terminology, those are so-called fish keratocytes, but let's look at uh, 
what this object has. It, it has a load, which is the nucleus behind, and it has this front part that's called lamella podium, which is like an engine or wheels. You see here, you cannot separate where are the wheels, where is the engine. Everything is combined into a, a common structure. And that's probably how the vehicles of the future will be. So, uh, uh, but uh, at the moment, we are still using quite rudimentary designs. That's why how cars uh, collide, cannot squeeze. For instance, these objects, they can squeeze through very small uh, spaces, like uh, metastatic cells can uh, penetrate the cracks in blood vessels. They can fluidize themselves, or when they need to uh, perform <coughs> pressure on the environment, they can become rigid. So here is another movie showing that uh, there is mechanics because you see there was a cell that was quietly standing and then it was just uh, mechanically affected by this pipette and it starts to move. So, uh, so all this needs to be understood uh, and we need to find uh, whether we can use mathematics for this. Now if we open a typical biological uh, book of course, people discuss cell, cell motility, uh, but it doesn't look like mechanics too much. So there would be some schematic picture. I would explain this a bit later. But mostly, uh, you will see a connection of so-called uh, downstream, upstream biochemical pathways of w which agent may affect the motion. And those are the, this is a complexity of those biochemical pathways that involved in, uh, in motility. Uh, so uh, if we try to simplify it, what we see that there is a, this load inside the nucleus and then there's a front side where there is some movement and uh, this is elongated part called lamella podium and that's what is uh, mechanical so here there is another movie showing maybe in more detail of uh, uh, what's happening inside this uh, structure. So there seem to be a, a flow inside uh, that's called retrograde flow. And we know that uh, uh, this body is in contact with the elastic or rigid environment. So it has to exert friction. And this friction is something that allows us to move. Because when we are in a very slippery road, like a few days ago, it was impossible to move. So we need to move our feet. And the friction plays an important role and the motion. So you see there is some motion that is excited inside. So the question is, can it be made simple? Simple means, can we write some equations that describe at least some part of this complexity, or it's completely hopeless and we need to uh, deal with this uh, huge number of, of elements that uh, biologists, biochemists identify? OK, so what are scales we are talking about? Uh, so cells are at a scale of micron. And the my, my mechanism, that uh, micro mechanism that is uh, responsible for this activity is at the scale of nanometers. So that's also the scale where currently mechanics is moving. So like 100 or 200 years ago, civil engineering uh, was about building the Eiffel Tower. But now many people are studying, for instance, dislocation, stru dislocational structures and crystals and even use uh, uh, quantum mechanics to, to, uh, to improve the, say, strength of, of materials to design new materials. So, so it's a parallel development, except that here this is a living system. So we would need to know at least something about this level in order to construct a model. Uh, and if we look at this level, so we are interested in this frontal part. We see there are a few elements. I don't know why it's. Uh, uh, so first, there is a friction. And it goes through this adhesive 
kind of uh, adhesive elements, uh, uh, proteins, integrins that uh, engage and disengage. So this friction is like you are grabbing something, but you cannot hold for too long, and then you release. So we have a transient uh, mechanical interaction that effectively produces this adhesion. There is also something that allows this frontal part to extend, and this is a process of growth. So it's called polymerization. There are some fibers there that's called actins that can grow and they can also disassemble. So they grow on one side and disassemble on the other. And my talk, uh, previous talk at, 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 uh, in this room was about growth, uh, not exactly in this framework. But now we're not going to talk much about growth. We are going to talk about contraction. So there is something inside that can contract. So there are these fibers that can also grow, but they're connected with so-called molecular motors that can pull the fibers together. And that can create local contraction. So it's a bit like rudimentary muscle uh, that acts inside. So that's it, that's a main mechanism and we need to <coughs> construct out of it uh, something that would remind us mechanics so the goal is to make a minimal modeling leading potentially to new and interesting mechanics. So we are asking ourselves a question, uh, does it extend, can, does the desire to, to address those issues can really uh, say something interesting for mechanics proper as a field, uh, not only that we can use the existing mechanics to solve some of these problems. So the simplest case is, uh, is a one dimensional so and in fact some cells are almost one dimensional so they are moving on a track so it was indicated uh, in fact on the surface and they follow it again they have this frontal part and they have this uh, uh, load that they carry the cargo uh, that is a part of their body so again there's no brain there we are not controlling it from outside it's a self-driving vehicle in a sense. So we want to understand how it works. Now, how to model it? So we have, uh, so people who study cells, they say that a cell, if we really try to link, to, to, to list all the elements that are in a single cell, like the ones that we've seen, it would be about a million entries. And also people are saying that the plane like this also uh, in, uh, has about million parts. Yes, but not those, pa all these parts are of the same importance. Uh, uh, for instance, there are cameras and there are other things, but if we are interested in a fundamental question, like for instance, what ensures the lift in, the, uh, in a plane, we can drop a lot of details and uh, we can study just the uh, airfoil and uh, focus on the presence of the sharp end and stuff like this. So that's the difficulty in dealing with the subject, not to put as many elements as possible, but to, uh, to eliminate as many elements as possible and to leave a kind of a, a uh, pure, pure mechanisms. And there is a, in, in, inside the community that tries to do it, there are optimists and pessimists and optimists thinking that something like this is possible, but pessimists are saying that we are confronting such level of complexity which is uh, fundamentally cannot be reduced and uh, so you have to follow the pathways so everything is important and so the simple physical models or as they call it mechanistic they don't call it mechanical they say mechanistic models uh, they are just a, a joke so you have to uh, uh, deal with this uh, environment which may be a bit uh, uh, unwelcoming for simple modeling, but still people are trying. So I'll show you the, some examples of uh, uh, our attempts to understand those things. So we need to some kind of prototypical idea of what, 
what makes this thing move. So this is our cell, we have to simplify, this is our cargo, uh, and there is this motor part. So we want to model the motor part. So we understand that something is moving inside the motor part. And let's take as a, uh, as an idea, as a main idea, guiding idea, a tank. Uh, 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 so there is uh, this belt that is moving, so it undergoes friction with the uh, environment, and the upper part has no friction, and by ensuring this motion, this retrograde flow inside, we can make the whole thing move. <coughs> Now, uh, the, this picture can be simplified. Uh, the picture can be simplified by uh, looking just at three uh, masses here. Uh, now, what do we have um, here? So, uh, so those are dashboards. That this is a spring that holds this thing together, but we need contraction because we want to emphasize the contraction. So let's put these elements here uh, and concentrate activity here. So those elements can contract. And uh, uh, chi 1 and chi 2 are the force couples that, uh, that can be created. You see at the micro scale, you cannot create a force. Yes, because it's a... Uh, uh, it's an internal forces, so we can create a couple of forces or we can create stress. So uh, those who studied mechanics enough, they understand that s stress is not a force, it's a, it's a, it's a force couples. So, so, so what active here is the ability of the system to generate stress. Now if we write a system of equations uh, describing the motion of these three mass viewed as uh, points, so we have all the entries here. For instance, for mass one, the, uh, uh, this is a friction force here. I don't know why it uh, uh, does this, but I hopefully you can still follow. So, so this is a spring, uh, the big spring that connects x1 and x3. This is chi, this is a force acting from this, uh, it's a one element of this force couple. And there is a dashboard uh, here, which is linear viscoelastic element. And we can do it for all other uh, elements. And we see that uh, uh, this system will have a trivial solution, which means all dots, or dotted variables are zero, so there is no velocity, unless chi1 is different from chi2, which means that you cannot have a homogeneous uh, contraction everywhere, so uh, the, uh, it should be inhomogeneous. So this is a key point. So if you manage to create inside the body inhomogeneous contraction, that can ultimately create uh, uh, motility. Uh, but of course, those elements have to somehow be coupled with other elements and because it's a self-driving, because if we just prescribe them, uh, uh, then it will be a guided uh, movement. So, so there is a still a long uh, way to go. So this is basically the idea. Between these two elements, there is internal element because of difference between these uh, force couples, this element can move from say element x3 to x, x1, and as a result, the whole thing will move to the right. So we can do the, uh, we can, for instance, find the velocity. Uh, uh, so if chi1 is different from chi2, and this difference is positive, then there will be, this g is a position of center of mass of the system. Uh, in fact, geometrical center of the system, and it will be moving with a constant velocity. Uh, now, in fact, uh, of course, it can only move as this body x2 goes from x3 to x1, but then it hits this body. So we need to uh, close the loop, and uh, uh, the idea is that uh, this element of x2, it moves from, uh, from one end to the other end, and then it disappears here, 
and, and reappears on the other end, and then again it moves, and this describes the whole cycle. Of course, uh, uh, in a full-scale model, we need to describe the reverse flow, but the reverse flow doesn't have a friction, and in our description it will be modeled as uh, a sink here of mass and the source here of mass on the other side. So, so before we do continuum limit, we can consider many elements like this. Sorry about this. I don't really see the reason because everything seemed to be uh, working, but... Huh? I think it's projector. Projector, okay, but apologies. So if we put n elements, we can still compute the, the, the force, the, the average velocity, which is related to inhomogeneity of distribution of these contractile couples. So this is a key. So the body is able to create inhomogeneous contraction inside the body, inside the, the uh, space occupied by the body, and this inhomogeneity of contraction can ultimately lead to, to, uh, to the motion. All right, so let's try to write continuum equations. Uh, so again, we are focusing on this motor part. And let's put these ingredients in a uh, form of differential equations. So first of all, uh, the divergence of stress, which is usually zero in mechanics, uh, here we cannot do this because we are, not, we are considering our body in, uh, uh, on a background, so there is a friction. And here the frictional force is proportional to velocity. That's how in a simplified way, we model this transient uh, adhesive uh, interaction with the environment. This can be done better, but that would be okay for our purposes. I remind you that we try to make the minimal, the, the most simple model. So now inside, you remember there were these dashboards, and uh, these dashboards are now modeled by Kelvin viscosity here. And this is a new element, so this is activity. So there is this active stress, so, which means that the system is able to produce active stress. So uh, as you will see later, this is in fact anti-dissipative element in the system. It's very unusual for continuum mechanicians because this is not related to constitutive behavior, to say, in fact, there is no elasticity here inside. It's infinitely compressible uh, because this is a secondary effect for us. We only need to connect the left and the right part of the body. But uh, there is this active stress. And uh, this is a model that's currently uh, uh, seriously considered as a model of active continuum. There are other models where people put active velocity or active uh, uh, stress uh, strain rate relation, but the simplest thing is to say there is this uh, chi, it's a, it's a field, it depends on x and t, and this, so inhomogeneity of this field would be ultimately responsible for self-advance of the body. So those are the motors here. And we have boundary conditions. So uh, uh, here, uh, these two elements also, uh, there's not only contraction, we also, uh, on this slide, uh, uh, we describe the growth as the velocity of the arriving material on one side with a plus sign and velocity of leaving material with a minus side. But in this talk, I'm not going to, I will drop this uh, uh, polymerization and this growth part of the story. So the only activity will be here. But in principle, there may be two types of activity. And this is what also in the textbooks identified as the active elements. A little comment that, in fact, this contraction, it's sometimes interpreted as active pullers. So there are some elements that pull. But while the growth uh, leads to local stretching, and though they are called pushers. So, so this is an attempt to rationalize somehow the picture. So we are going to neglect the pushers, and we'll only talk about pullers, because it's enough 
it turns out that the pushers are important when the cell is moving on the highway and uh, when it needs to reach a sufficient speed. But uh, to initiate motility, to, to uh, polarize, because it's important to polarize in order to move, only contraction uh, is, is relevant at this stage. You see, usually cell is symmetric. For instance, when it has to divide, it becomes round because it has to find the center. While when it moves, it polarizes. And uh, so the, the cargo moves to the left and, and the kind of lamellopodium develops on in front. OK. Now we are already, uh, uh, we can think about equations because this is a system of equations. This tau is this active. Now we write it as stress. It's in 1D, active stress. But this, the problem is still not closed uh, because we don't, know, uh, we don't know anything about this tau. And one uh, possibility is to say, OK, let's uh, consider this as an optimal, optimality problem. So we need to distribute this tau over tau, which is the contractile stresses along the, uh, the body uh, in such a way to achieve particular result. For instance, to achieve maximum velocity. Uh, and this is, would be kind of reverse engineering. So we can try, and this problem we, we solved also. There is a distribution of tau that ensures, for instance, maximum velocity. But we still don't know whether it really has anything to do with the real thing because the mechanism should be, uh, should be natural, should be physical, yes? And this is just a, 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 a set of actuators that we can control from outside. So I'm not going to present here the solution of this problem, but we are going to now address the question of how to define this tau. How tau, this uh, uh, active stress, depends on the other parameters of the body. And here it will be very, it's interesting that the first person who addressed this question was in the University of Minnesota. And this is Professor Scriven from chemical engineering, whom many of you uh, know. Uh, he was interested in chemomechanical coupling, in the system with chemomechanical coupling. So why I'm talking about uh, chem chemistry here? Because, uh, because the energy uh, that's needed to provide this active contraction must come from somewhere, yes? And as we know from usual cars, the fuel must be burned and as a result, the work is done. So very similar things are happening in the bodies. It's just that engine is everywhere, fuel is everywhere. So the fuel is so-called ATP. ATP is a certain type of big molecules that undergo hydrolysis. That's the final element of our metabolic uh, product uh, process. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so when this fuel, uh, so there must be some chemical reaction on the background, but then this reaction must be coupled somehow with mechanics. And from this, life appears. So let's try to, to think in these terms. So, uh, so our equations uh, had these elements, which was the, just a balanced law. There was a friction here proportional to velocity. And here inside sigma, you remember there was viscosity and there was activity. Yes, there was also mass balance. Now, uh, uh, we know that the, the active force, uh, active couples are provided by this motor. So let's introduce the concentration of these motors. And uh, they are attached and they are advected by the flow of mass. But they also can diffuse because they can detach and, in fact, randomly uh, in the presence of uh, uh, thermal fluctuations. So, so there is a diffusion of these active agents. And there is a reaction. So uh, reaction, uh, the, the zeta is the uh, advance of reaction. So it's, 
here we also in a movie media, but it's, it's a full derivative of this variable, so in each material point, and it's equal to uh, some rate of reaction. But of course, we don't know what is j here, we don't know what is uh, uh, nu here yet. So we st the coupling still doesn't happen, didn't happen, but, uh, but we have the elements, so there is advection because the motors that produce the force by themselves advected by the flow, the, there is diffusion limited, and there is a reaction. Uh, so, uh, so there must be somewhere free energy here. So this free energy depends on concentration of motors and the advance of this reaction. The derivative in, in this uh, reaction, uh, there must be zeta here, uh, is the so-called uh, uh, affinity. Uh, and the derivative in concentration is the chemical potential. So now we can turn the crank and uh, uh, try to write the energy balance. So this is a work done. Uh, this is the change in the free energy and the difference is the dissipation that must be positive. So I want go in the details, we can substitute these uh, equations uh, and we can come up with the expression for the rate of dissipation. Now, uh, so this is the usual viscous, what usually is described as uh, viscous dissipation. This is a usual chemical dissipation. It's uh, the driving force of the chemical reaction multiplied by the rate of chemical reaction and this is a dissipation due to diffusion. So, so far, this is rather standard. And what Scriven have understood is that there is a coupling between reaction and stress. Uh, so reaction can create uh, forces, not forces, stresses, because uh, it's internal uh, uh, elements, so it can create force couples. So we can use a kind of linear, simplest linear on Zagier type of relations here. As you see now, in usual viscous fluid, stress would be proportional to the strain rate here. But now it's also affected by this reaction. And also reaction now is affected by mechanics. And we assume that diffusion is completely decoupled. So this cross coefficients, this is a chemomechanical coupling. So the basic idea is that in terms of chemical degrees of freedom, the system goes down uh, potential energy, so uh, energy is released, while this allows, in terms of mechanical variables, the system to go up the stairs and to do the work. So you have to organize this type of uh, uh, balance, uh, but you need to keep chemical reaction out of equilibrium so that there would be you have to remove the product and bring the reactants to maintain the uh, reaction out of equilibrium so that the slope of potential energy would always uh, uh, generate the release and then ultimately the, uh, the energy that's needed to drive mechanical system up the, slo uh, up the slope of mechanical. Uh, so, uh, so this chemomechanical coupling, if we uh, follow this type of linear relations, we see that uh, stress will be not only uh, viscous, <coughs> but there will be also a part related to chemistry. And this is exactly the part that is, uh, that is active. So the important thing that came here is that the active stress, even in this linear approximation, it's proportional to the concentration this, in this case, volumetric concentration of the, uh, of the motors, of these active agents. Uh, now you see this, now we no longer have tau here. We have uh, uh, that, this, that the active stress is proportional to the concentration, and concentration by itself uh, of the motor satisfies this uh, mm, uh, advec advection diffusion equation. Uh, and, this is, uh, and this is the crucial element here. Uh, uh, this is basically all the model. 
so in, uh, boundary conditions. So this basic springs that imitates the membrane here is put. So this is non-penetratable uh, for the matter uh, boundaries. And this is the, uh, the fact that the, uh, it's blocked uh, in terms of diffusion on both sides. Uh, OK, so this is our simple airfoil, our simple system. But it's not so simple because there is a, this quadratic nonlinearity here. But that's a minimal nonlinearity. Now, if you uh, compute the, you remember that G was the, uh, uh, was the way we denoted the center of mass of the system. So G dot is the velocity of the whole thing. So you can show that velocity will be non-zero if uh, this integral is non-zero. So of course, uh, uh, that suggests that C of X and T, this distribution of motors, should be uh, asymmetric. Uh, we can try to dimensionalize, and we'll uh, end up with three non-dimensional parameters that I don't think I can discuss it in detail. But that's our simple system that we end up with. Look at what it is. So it's equation for distribution of motors for the concentration. But this advective term depends on stress distribution. And stress distribution by itself this is like a Helmholtz operator, and then there is a concentration on the right. So what, it means, the, uh, what does it mean? So it, it means that the motors themselves, they cause stress distribution. Stress distribution drives the motion, and the motion drags the, uh, the motors. So, so there is a mechanical coupling, and that leads to uh, to localization of motors and ultimately to the velocity, to the overall velocity of the system. In fact, in mathematics, systems like this have been studied, but in, the, in a different framework, not in mechanical setting. And it's called, it's one of the examples of so-called Keller-Ziegel system. So look at this equation. So it's, uh, uh, so so uh, if this is a linear part, and this is nonlinear part. Nonlinearity is quadratic. So if we eliminate sigma here, we can write it as a uh, fully non-local non -local equation. In, in fact, the system has a lot of similarity with Navier-Stokes equations. Because in Navier-Stokes equations, there is an incompressibility constraint that creates uh, uh, non-locality in the system, and it also has quadratic nonlinearity. So it's a kind of a scalar version of Navier-Stokes equation. And of course, the solutions are quite complex. But in particular, you can, exp uh, you can expect localization, and, uh, and this ultimately leads to motility. OK, so uh, in, in addition to the scalar Ziegel system, we also have free boundaries, because uh, in order to move, we have to unleash the, the two ends. And we have a boundary condition that allows us to find the positions of the boundaries. So, so this is our simple mathematical model of motility. So you see, we dropped lots and lots of details. But we get an interesting system that uh, uh, kind of in mechanics proper uh, did not uh, appear before. All right, so we can study traveling wave solutions. So if you uh, pr create initial state uh, and in a certain range of parameter, the, the symmetric initial state is unstable. Mo all motors will move on one side. They form this lamella podium, and the system will, will move. So um, I don't think I have a lot of time to, to, to talk about details. I can refer you to, to papers. But this, for instance, shows the, um, the multiplicity of solutions uh, for the given para non-dimensional parameters traveling wave solutions. There are many solutions. Also, we know, for instance, that for Navier-Stokes, there are many, uh, many solutions. 
uh, stationary solution. That's an example of stationary solution. And then non-stationary solution evolves uh, near these stationary solutions. But, uh, but one can identify the motility initiation. The bifurcation diagrams can be constructed. Uh, you see what's uh, shown on the right is the configuration of, say, concentration C, stress sigma inside, and velocity V. So inside the body, this, uh, uh, there is a movement, yes? So velocity is inhomogeneous, stress is inhomogeneous, and concentration. So there are symmetric solutions that are static, and there are non-symmetric, which appear in twins, so it can move, it doesn't know where to move, to the left or to the right. But uh, if the motors will concentrate on, on, on this side, then the cell will move to the right and, and, and opposite. So there are many details here. But maybe one thing is interesting. Uh, so this is a typical uh, bifurcational diagram here. So this line is at the velocity equal to zero plane. Those are static solutions. But static solutions at some level of activity, which is controlled by these parameters of this chemomechanical coupling, can become unstable. And you have two dynamic solutions with no, either positive or negative velocity. I think I have it here. So motility initiation is a super, uh, supercritical bifurcation up to here in terms of parameter characterizing how many motors total we have in the system. If it's not enough, we have symmetric distribution of motors. But if uh, we reach a critical uh, level of uh, total mass of motors, they all concentrate on, uh, let's say, on the left here, because there is another piece here when they concentrate on the other side. And the cells start to move. And when velocity increases, the localization of motors, you remember this, chi1 was different from chi2. So you have extreme inhomogeneity of distribution of motors. And then uh, the system can move. And we can imitate the different experiments when the cell was symmetric and then it was touched, like in uh, in the, one of the movies that I showed, and then it starts to move. So here there was a symmetric distribution of motors, and here it became non-symmetric, and it starts to move. And we can locate uh, experimental data versus this our stability boundary, and it's quite good. Um, now let's go to this question of optimality. You remember that. So this is a distribution of motors. This uh, rho or C, we call it in, in some slides. Uh, you remember that tau, uh, this uh, inhomogeneity of contraction, we could just uh, uh, find by solving optimization problems. So what is the uh, distribution of uh, contractile forces uh, that would ensure maximum velocity? And this is given here by the dashed line. And the solid line gives the real distribution due to this mechanism. Let's call it Scriven type of mechanism. And you see it's very close to optimality. So, so this physical mechanism that involves advection, reaction, and diffusion produce almost optimal conditions for the uh, uh, for cell to move. So it, it sounds like. Uh, this is uh, at least major uh, fundamental parts of this mechanism have been captured. Now, one can also look at how this active object, so its active object, how it uh, behaves if it's subjected to a force. So if it were a passive object, and we know that there is a viscous friction from the environment, what do we expect? Force velocity relation. It would be some kind of line here, maybe a curve. But this curve, like this black line, would be sitting in this quadrant and in this quadrant. So which means that if force is positive, also velocity is positive, which means that if we apply force, this object will be dragged by this force. And in fact, it, it, it is uh, uh, fully located 
uh, in these two quadrants when the activity of motors, there is a parameter there, it's sufficiently small. But when it increases, the curves start to develop this type of loops. This is increasing motor activity and it starts to enter this quadrant. So what does it mean that we are here? It means that the product force and velocity is no longer positive. It means that although the force is acting to the right, cell wants to move to the left and it's actually dragging a, a, a cargo. So this is active area. This is anti-dissipative behavior. So we have to get rid of our paradigms like we develop in mechanics where uh, energy must dissipate and uh, uh, still entropy of course must be produced but one has to be very careful because we can encounter this anti-dissipative behavior which is activity and uh, uh, now of course uh, everything will be all right if we add the chemical part of the of the problem and compute total entropy production but this shows that there is no much mystery in life in a sense so uh, of course there is a lot of complexity but still uh, uh, some simple structure emerging but we have to be careful as mechanicians with these active systems because uh, uh, we enter these forbidden areas because I'm sure many professors here teach students that uh, you cannot have constitutive modeling of say viscoelastic behavior uh, where anything is happening in these areas because that would violate some inequalities that are uh, postulated. Now uh, let's suppose we attach this cell to with a spring to a wall so it would be like a dog with a leash uh, attached to the wall. What would the dog do? The dog uh, would try to liberate itself and the cell is alive so it's active. So we develop a uh, different type of uh, uh, motion. So there is a static is when uh, the cell just stops at a certain level, at a certain distance, stretches the spring but, uh, but it's symmetric. So it's a static and passive regime but it can also oscillate which means it tries to uh, the motors concentrate on one side it starts to move away from the wall but then the force increases so the motors uh, repel the system repolarizes it moves in the other direction so this is a complex solutions of this uh, keller ziegel system or it may be stall when the, your dog is just trying to pull as much as possible in one direction and the spring controls it. So we can construct a phase diagram and the parameter here is the elasticity of the spring and the, the activity <coughs> of motors is one of the coefficients. So here you have self-induced oscillations and in fact it's known that cells they're not really static like even in epithelial layers even they're surrounded by their neighbors, they're, they're slightly moving. It's like us, if you put us in a crowd, we're not going to stand still. We'll touch the neighbor and we'll, so there will be some activity because we have ATP uh, uh, hydrolysis all the time. So we need to move, yes? And, and so that's also solutions of these equations. They produce these oscillations. Now you can also study cell collision in this way. So you take these two cells moving towards each other and one regime is when they interact and then they move as if there was elastic interaction because they have their preferred velocity. They arrived with their preferred velocity at this level of contractile activity and they separate. So it's, but there is nothing elastic there. It's, uh, uh, but it looks, uh, Mm, elastic but in other regime they uh, they can start moving together they can just uh, block each other and uh, they can also bypass each other no, but that's I won't discuss this and you can construct a, a diagram so one can start thinking about collective interaction between the cells or cells inside some kind of crowded environment uh, mm, 
also one interesting result here is that if we uh, put the cell in the uh, uh, surrounded by elastic environment so it it may be static uh, uh, sorry if we subject the this uh, the cell not uh, uh, to a force but to a couple of forces for instance we squeeze it uh, or we release the squeezing uh, th so this parameter characterizes squeezing or stretching so it's a couple of forces now so the cell can be static or it can move and in fact some of the theories of cancer is that we violate in epithelial layers this kind of confinement that's created by surrounding uh, um, uh, cells and so if it's violated cell starts to compensate it overcompensate and eventually starts to move so this diagram is uh, putting some uh, uh, meaning mechanical meaning to this so cells like to be uh, squeezed to a certain level but if if we uh, uh, ease this uh, squeeze uh, up to a certain level then uh, so p is the level of contractile activity which is total number of motors inside uh, then it starts to move so there are all kinds of predictions that can be made here and i'll end uh, showing you again the movie i hope you look with the different eyes now this self-driving cars with soft collisions we are on the way towards understanding of the systems and potentially they can be imitated artificially at a maybe larger scale but engineering will eventually is there's no question about it will we go into design of the self-propelling objects of this type and this is a real challenge for mechanicians so uh, i uh, strongly recommend young people to to look at this as a as a civil engineering environment of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lech. Before we proceed to the question, I want to tell you that Lech is MTS visiting professor. He will be here today, Monday and Tuesday, so you're very welcome and actually encouraged to stop by his office, 152, and discuss with him this topic and many other topics. He has very <laughs> wide background and always like to talk about mechanics. So, and now we have time maybe for a couple of questions. I think big, bigger, bigger than you're thinking. Um, I'm curious why you chose to view the, uh, your motivating part, uh, and then a load that's being pulled behind uh, I don't know, it looked like a snail or a, 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 a large truck with the engine in front and then the, the load, because in fact, that, that load behind is, is the source of energy that's keeping the thing keep propelling. So there has to actually be, uh, you call them your motors, there has to be some uh, transfer of mass that's going on from the load to the tractor trailer out front pulling it, and that's not part of your model. No, no, obviously many, many things are not part of the model. So the, uh, uh, the nucleus is here. So nucleus control production of motors. So if the nucleus is getting signals that more motors is needed, these proteins are, uh, are produced and delivered. So we try to just isolate this kind of motor part, viewing this as a kind of a belt. And we assume that the uh, reaction there is kept out of equilibrium with a certain kind of level of non-equilibrium. And we have a constant amount of motors. But of course, this is a smarter system. You remember there are a million parts there, yes? And we are far from describing all of them. But that's a, that's a kind of a complexity here because the more you start to put in, <coughs> Uh, the less transparency you have and, and uh, less hope to, to, to understand something. So that's why, of course, uh, we 
uh, we just starting and there are already my student who is a part of this project he is now uh, uh, submitted a paper with a two-dimensional version where you can predict a, a shape uh, uh, so but it's not exactly this shape there are many many things but again mathematical modeling is not about putting everything in but dropping as much as possible uh, but without losing the the baby uh, with the water bathtub water so anyway but uh, it's it's a beginning yes just one question because we have Jews uh, the interesting part to me was this anti-dissipative part of it. Can that mean that you ignore some of the energy in there or overlook it? So, so energy balance is not correct? No, as I said, there is a chemical and mechanical part. So if you isolate only mechanical part, it looks as if it's anti-dissipative. But uh, it's because some other part is strongly dissipative. It's like us, we produce ideas, but we also destroy highly organized products like plants, yes? Plants have a lot of structure, and we turn it to, into the structureless uh, kind of systems so uh, so of course the thermodynamics is correct but uh, it's convenient here to to describe parts of the systems as anti-dissipative and this is a new thing for us uh, uh, well, the, global level, yeah. the global yes yes so I, we have to we can sleep quietly <laughs> so not everything that we teach is is wrong uh. Okay, so I unfortunately have to stop discussion now, but as I said, left is around. Please join me in thanking you for everything.